Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris, you're watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. Our mission remains unchanged. Until that mission changes, we will continue to put forth our maximum effort uh, to safely evacuate as many people as possible. Six days left, mission unchanged. The U.S. rushing to get Afghans out of Kabul while the intelligence community is furious and disgusted that thousands of them will be left behind. It does make me feel a little bit better about it, but they also, like, that got approved really quick. So I don't know if it's just the hesitancy of everyone that isn't getting vaccinated. A possible booster for J&J, &J, full FDA approval for Pfizer. Are Americans more inclined to get a COVID shot now? Plus, a lesson in paying it forward, how historically black colleges and universities are wiping away student debt. We start today at the White House. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli has the latest from the administration on Afghanistan. Mike, Secretary of State Tony Blinken saying there are hundreds of Americans still in Afghanistan who want to leave. The exact number has been kind of hard to pin down, though. Uh, what will it take to get them out between now and next Tuesday? Yeah, Allison, I mean, this has been the number one question we've been trying to get a hold of for the last week or so. Just how many Americans are on the ground and just how many Americans really are trying to get out of Afghanistan, because it's important. The president made a pretty solemn commitment that everyone who wants to get out will be able to do so. So we got a little bit of clarity from Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who said that based on a State Department analysis, this is not a hard count. They believe that there were 6,000 Americans on the ground and that they've already evacuated some 4,500 of, uh, of them. So that's a, a significant uh, amount with some days left still to get the remaining 1,000 to 1,500 uh, who, in their view, want to come out, uh, out. Now, let's take a listen to what some of the Secretary of State's comments today indicated in terms of how that would actually take place. For the remaining roughly 1,000 contacts that we had, who may be Americans seeking to leave Afghanistan, we're aggressively reaching out to them multiple times a day through multiple channels of communication, phone, email, text messaging, to determine whether they still want to leave. Let me be crystal clear about this. There is no deadline on our work to help any remaining American citizens who decide they want to leave to do so, along with the many Afghans who have stood by us over these many years and want to leave and have been unable to do so. That last part from the Secretary of State actually was the most interesting thing he said today because we've been focused very narrowly on this August 31st deadline as a deadline about the U.S. military presence in Afghanistan. And what the Secretary of State seems to be implying there is that there could still be efforts absent military involvement uh, to, to try to continue uh, to get further Americans out. But one thing we also know, Allison, is there's some private efforts independent of the government that are already underway involving private contractors and the like. And so this is uh, really an effort that is significant, but hard to really get numbers on when there are so many different moving parts here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Mike, the Pentagon announcing today that all troops have to get their COVID vaccines immediately. Uh, more than 800,000 service members still unvaccinated, according to the AP. What's the Defense Department plan here? Yeah, it's been interesting to see the discrepancies in the vaccination mm. rates, even among the different service branches, the Army having among the lowest level. But this step that was taken today by the Pentagon, no surprise, especially given what we just saw this week, which is Pfizer uh, getting that full authorization rather than the emergency use authorization that's underway. And we've gotten a memo from uh, the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in which he says that to defend this nation, we need a healthy and ready force after careful consideration with experts and leadership here at the military. And with the support of the president significantly said, I've determined that mandatory vaccination is necessary to protect the force and defend the American people. And so now the Pentagon gets into the implementation business. They're an implementation branch, as they've been saying so often this week. And so there will be a plan to help make the vaccine available on military bases and in other locations for all those service members who now will be required to get the COVID vaccine, just like they are required to get so many other vaccines, Allison. Mike, President Biden hosting some big names at the White House today to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, who was there and what are the big takeaways from that meeting? What do you know? Yeah, so this was a significant meeting that 
uh, on an issue that we were spending a lot of time talking about in the weeks and months ago. Remember the uh, colonial pipeline hack, among others, that were significant news events. Well, today, the president, as part of his administration's efforts to deal with this problem, convened not just members of his cabinet, but significant number of uh, executives, including uh, Tim Cook from Apple. We had the CEOs of Microsoft, of Google, of Amazon, of IBM, <coughs> who were all in the room as part of this conversation today. And the president outlined the steps that the administration is taking, but also uh, indicated that there is work here for the private sector to do as well. Take a listen. The reality is most of our critical infrastructure owned and operated, is owned and operated by the private sector, and the federal government can't meet this challenge alone. So I've invited you all here today because you have the power, the capacity, uh, and the responsibility, I believe, to raise the bar on cybersecurity. More broadly, Allison, I think it's interesting to see what we saw today with the president convening this meeting on cybersecurity. Yesterday, he addressed his legislative agenda. Tomorrow, he's welcoming the Israeli prime minister. There's a walk and chew gum, you know, sort of posture at the White House here, even as Afghanistan continues to dominate the headlines. All right, Mike Memley at the White House, where they are walking and chewing gum. Thank you so much. Fury and disgust at the CIA, the Pentagon, and in Congress over the thousands of Afghans will be left behind when the U.S. withdraws next Tuesday. NBC News correspondent Ken Delaney and one of the reporters on this story. Ken, a defense official saying he got nauseous just thinking about how many Afghan allies we are going to leave behind. What else are you hearing from your sources in national security? They're just really, really angry, Allison, because they know that there are just yeah. as thousands of Afghans who worked their hearts out for the United States over the last 20 years, whose lives are in danger and just are not going to be able to make it to the airport and get out of there in time. Um, and it, and it's a, it, it, as a result of a series of decisions that were made, some of which may have been unavoidable. This was always going to be messy. Um, but and, and they're not only just worried about those individuals. You know, there's a lot of sort of really horrible stories, but they're also worried about what this means for America's reputation in the world. You know, Chinese diplomats are out there tweeting and, and essentially trolling the United States and saying, hey, Taiwan, this is what it means to have America as your friend. They're not going to stand up for you. And so that, you know, that that um, really has repercussions that are hard to calculate right now, but they're not good, Allison. Ken, uh, Republican Senator Ben Sass saying, damn the deadline. He wants President Biden to tell the Taliban, we're getting our people out however long it takes so that we are perfectly willing to spill Taliban, al-Qaeda and ISIS blood to do it. Definitely not mincing words there. Uh, defense officials, though, are painting a pretty dire picture of how that fight might play out. What are they saying? What they're saying is that that's a really naive view on the part of the senator because the yeah. 6,000 U.S. troops at the airport are surrounded by thousands of hardened Taliban fighters. They control the perimeter of the airport. They control the hills around the city. And if, if, if fighting broke out, it would be a really ugly situation and a lot of Americans would die, is what military officials are saying. And a lot of civilians would die and the evacuations would basically be over at that point. Um, it, it, it's not even I mean, I don't think people appreciate the extent to which Taliban cooperation is facilitating these evacuations. Now, there's some reports today that they've stopped cooperating, and we've, se we've seen photos of, of half-empty planes getting out of there. But that just shows you that the Taliban is crucial to this situation. And if things break down and there starts to be uh, a fight between American troops and the Taliban, that, that's just a bad situation. We just don't have a lot of leverage. Once we left Bagram and, and pulled most of our forces out, we gave up yeah. the leverage that we had, and it's just a really difficult situation. Ken, uh, let's talk about all the finger pointing this week. And I know that could take hours because there's plenty <laughs> of it going around. Uh, we know President Biden has been getting a whole lot of blame. But who else is, is mad at whom right now? There's repetitive stress injury from all the finger pointing, Allison. So, you know, the, you saw <laughs> the <real>? military, <laughs> military in the White House are mad at the intelligence community. They're saying they didn't warn sufficiently that this whole thing was going to collapse. The intelligence community says absolutely not. We did, we, you know, included in our scenarios was a rapid collapse. Um, a lot of people are upset with the State Department saying that they didn't process these special immigrant visas quickly enough. There's a huge backlog. And as a result, now a lot of Afghans just don't have the right paperwork. The State Department says, hey, Congress imposed a Byzantine process on us. We were doing the best we can. Um, and, and then 
Frankly, a lot of national security officials point a finger back at the White House and the national security process and say that even though we all knew President <coughs> Biden wanted to get out, this was not the way to do it. It was badly managed, badly handled. Ken, as you said, so much finger pointing going on in Washington. Uh, they're getting stress injuries. Thanks so much uh, for your reporting today. Always appreciate you it. Bet. Thanks, Allison. Washington should be ashamed. Congressman Seth Moulton and Peter Major out with that scathing statement after secretly visiting Afghanistan's Kabul airport yesterday. But now they're under fire for making that trip. NBC News national political reporter Sahil Kapoor is on Capitol Hill. Sahil, Speaker Pelosi calling this deadly serious. Let's get into the bipartisan criticism of this trip and then we can talk about what they saw there. Yeah, Allison, these two members of Congress, uh, Seth Moulton, the Massachusetts Democrat, and Peter Meyer, the Michigan Republican, are facing a, a, a a serious backlash from members of both parties and various parts of the federal government for traveling to Kabul unannounced in a secret trip without getting permission from the federal government, which members of Congress are supposed to do. Uh, Sarah Jacobs, who is a Democratic congresswoman from California, had probably the sharpest criticism, accusing them of taking up space in a disaster zone for the sake of their own egos. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, the House Republican leader, also said it was a bad idea that they should not have gone, that resources should be dedicated, as we heard similarly from uh, Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary, just moments ago, that resources should be dedicated to this massive evacuation mission that includes tens of thousands of people. Uh, kind of a tough moment for these two. So, Sahil, in their joint statement, the congressman said after talking with the commander on the ground and seeing the situation here, it is obvious that because we started the evacuation so late that no matter what we do, we won't get everyone out on time, even by September 11th. What else are we hearing from them on Afghanistan, and, and are they defending their trip? That is the crux of their point, Allison. It seems to be a uh, part of a, a pressure campaign on the Biden administration to keep troops there, to keep a U.S. presence there for as long as it takes to uh, get these people out. And they are raising the warning flag, arguing, uh, contrary to what the administration thinks, that they are not going to be able to get uh, people out, American citizens and U.S. partners in Afghanistan out by the uh, August 31st deadline. They are also defending uh, their trip by arguing that no other seats on the plane uh, that flew out of there were taken up, because, of course, that's one of the criticisms. Every seat that's taken up by them could have theoretically gone to someone else that the U.S. is trying to evacuate. Sahil, the House voting to advance the budget resolution and the infrastructure bill, but that was the easy part. Here's the Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy talking about those two bills today on CNBC. We'll have $5 trillion on the books in, in, in September and well, that you can't stop. Well, it'll be under my, over my dead body because I'm going to do everything in our power to stop it. Uh, Sahil, over my dead body, that doesn't sound so great for Democrats. What are they up against here? Well, they are up against total unified Republican opposition. I think you just heard it there from Kevin McCarthy. It could not have been clear. And look, this is not new. Democrats knew all along that they're going to have to do this multi-trillion dollar bill if they do it without any Republican support. And what does that mean? That means they need 50 out of 50 Democratic senators to vote for it. That means in the House, they have a, a margin of error of just three Democrats. We saw this week how perilous that can be for Democrats trying to get anything done. It means that they will have to get virtually every member of their party in the House and the Senate on board with a multi-trillion dollar bill that will uh, include the, the biggest expansion of the social safety net in generations. It's not the kind of thing that one party typically does, especially with these margins. Democrats have a, a tough road ahead. Sahil, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act passed in the House along party lines, so let's talk about what it's up against in the Senate. The exact same thing that Democrats' other voting rights bill is up against in the Senate, the filibuster, the 60-vote threshold to pass uh, major pieces of legislation that don't involve taxes and spending. Right now, the landscape is pretty simple. Democrats passed the John Lewis Voting Rights Act on a party-line basis in the House of Representatives. In the Senate, they will need at least 10 Republicans to go along in order to pass it. They have one. 
Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. That is not going to be enough. The Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, is against it. And at this moment, there is no viable path to 60. So Democrats are going to have to either abolish or create a carve out to the filibuster in order to get this through. And just to note, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, it's designed to patch up a piece of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that was gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013. It requires states with a history of discrimination over a rolling 25-year period to get pre-approval from the federal government for any changes to their voting laws. It essentially updates that formula that Chief Justice John Roberts and uh, the conservatives at the time said was inapplicable from the 1960s. Again, they have to, uh, it's going to be very difficult to pass into law uh, at this moment, Allison. All right, Sahu Kapoor on Capitol Hill. Thank you so much. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She has the latest headlines from NBCnews.com. Hi, Simone. Hi, Allison. We are going to start in Minnesota today. That's where the Greenwood fire has doubled in size, forcing evacuations for campers trying to get some R&R around McDougal Lake. The heavy smoke and heat creating a so-called fire cloud that produced lightning and rain. Officials hope that heavy rain in the forecast will slow the growth of that fire over the course of the next week. And Delta Airlines increasing health insurance premiums for unvaccinated employees. The $200 a month increase will begin on November 1st. The airline CEO citing the steep cost to cover COVID hospitalizations, adding all Delta employees who have been recently hospitalized with the virus were not fully vaccinated. The company stopped short of a vaccine mandate, but unvaccinated employees will face several other restrictions. And Serena Williams pulling out of the U.S. Open. The tennis star announcing in an Instagram post that she's decided to withdraw from the tournament to give her body some time to heal from a torn hamstring. Earlier this year, Williams dropped out of Wimbledon after sustaining an injury during the first round. And the Hubble Space Telescope has captured what's called an Einstein ring. The image from the European Space Agency shows two galaxies that are billions of light years away from Earth, warping and deflecting light from an even farther galaxy behind them. The phenomenon is named after Albert Einstein, who first predicted that gravity could bend light. And how about just two letters, just yay. Kanye West has asked a Los Angeles court to legally change his name from Kanye Omari West to his longtime nickname, Ye. Now, a judge has to sign off on the name change before it becomes official. Kanye's 10th studio album, Donda, is scheduled to be released before the end of this month. I mean, you knew it was going to happen, right, Allison? It's just, it's inevitable. It's just so Kanye. If I can still say that. It's so Kanye. Five letters? <laughs> Five letters is too much. Just just two. That's all he needs. That's all you need. Simone, thank you so much. <laughs> Students in Iowa's largest school district back in class today, and masks are not required. Iowa's one of eight states with a ban on making masks mandatory for students. The Des Moines School District telling NBC News, quote, Iowa's pandemic policies can most politely be called pro-COVID. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett is outside Edmonds Elementary School, which is in Des Moines. So Maura, last year I understand the Des Moines School District didn't follow the state. It kept students home to learn virtually instead of bringing them back to the classroom. So how's the district handling the state's mask mandate ban now? Well, Allison, the difference between this year and last year is that that mask mandate ban was made into law just before the end of the last school year. And so that makes it more difficult for the district to push back against uh, the, the mandate ban. And the reason why the superintendent is hesitant to push back and enact a mask mandate like we've seen in states like Texas and Florida is because when they did that virtual learning push against uh, express authorization from the governor, he actually had his license threatened. He had to sit before a hearing uh, and almost lost his job as an educator. And so he's trying to play ball with the state. But there's a clean divide between what the state's looking for and schools like the Des Moines uh, School District as kids go back to school this week, Allison. So, Maura, what are you hearing from parents in the district there? Where are they falling on this whole mask thing? 
Well, I'll have to mention that Des Moines is in one of the largest Democratic counties in a largely Republican state. And so that's okay. what parents are pointing out, is that Governor Reynolds here is trying to make this a political battle and isn't considering the health and safety of their kids. I spoke with Thomas yesterday. He's a father of four, all four kids under the age of 12. So that means they cannot be vaccinated. But they're going back to school this week because he tried to homeschool his kids with his wife uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. But it, it's just too much to handle. And so he's really frustrated. Frustrated uh, about the fact that he has to worry about the health and safety of his kids day to day. Take a listen to some of our conversation. We know that masks help slow the spread. People have decided to make it a culture war issue instead of a public health issue and then promote this because they think it's going to win primaries and then general elections. But at what cost? Uh, and I think the cost is pretty clear at this point. It's going to be sick children. Right. It's unfortunately going to be dead children. We do all kinds of stuff we don't want to every day. I mean, it's not like the schools have given up their dress codes. Right. It's not like we've given up the measures against peanut allergies. Like you can do things that take a little bit of effort. The kids are often better about keeping their masks on than the adults are. Now, one of the governor's arguments is that she supports parental choice for kids to wear masks in school, but she also cites experts warning that masks could be uh, a cause of long-term developmental learning uh, with their kids or, or social and emotional learning uh, causing blocks because they can't see everyone's faces. But Thomas pushes back against that, saying that longer developmental challenges with learning could come from being out of school for two weeks at a time or more if they get sick or long-term COVID or brain fog. And so he'd rather see his kids masked up. And when you look at the larger picture statewide, actually, Allison, outside of the district as kids are going back to school across the state. One district in western Iowa already had to delay its back to school because of a COVID outbreak. Another mom, just before we came on air, just actually filed a lawsuit against the Republican governor here because of the mask mandates, because she's concerned about the health and safety of her kids. And so this is going to be a big debate, especially going into the fall. And even so, the, the Iowa uh, Education Association is warning districts that they need to start having these conversations about how to keep kids safe, given the parameters that they're given and, and what they need to measure in terms of when they might need to close schools because of further outbreaks. Yeah, so Maura, while you've got these debates, these lawsuits, all of these things going on on the side, what's the superintendent's plan there if there is a COVID outbreak? What are they going to do? Well, so that's the tricky thing. First of all, they don't have the methods to protect the kids from preventing them getting sick. They, they can't enact the mask mandate. These kids can't get vaccinated. But what's more is they don't have, like they did last year, they don't have a state metric system to know when kids are getting sick in terms of tracking these outbreaks. They're not doing contact tracing this year. So that becomes very difficult to, to measure. I asked the superintendent what that looks like and how they're going to manage it. And this is what he told me. There's really no avenue um, to do anything except for um, consulting with our local health department, um, closing the school. Um, virtual instruction would not count. And so we would just have to close the school for a period of time and then make up those days. The superintendent saying that all of this is very frustrating. He feels isolated. He says the state is making it harder to do his job because you have to realize when they close the school, like he said, they can't give the remote learning option uh, to students. And so then they need to tack on those days to the end of the year. But another Iowa state law mandates that schools need to be out of session by the end of June. And so as they add on this extra time, that could ultimately cut off these kids' education uh, throughout the, this year. And that's a big struggle that superintendents across the state are looking at because they don't have those metrics on when to close schools or how to maintain the children's safety and their education. Maura, I do not envy superintendents during this pandemic in any state, in any school district. They have an unbelievable uh, challenge on their hands. Uh, thank you so much for reporting from Des Moines today. Another COVID booster could be coming. Johnson & Johnson saying a booster shot of its vaccine gives a nine-fold increase in COVID antibodies. The company releasing data supporting a booster for its one-shot vaccine after eight months. That data now going to the FDA. The Biden administration already saying the booster shots will be available for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines starting this fall. Meanwhile, health experts are hoping that this week's full FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine will motivate COVID shot skeptics. NBC News correspondent Jack Brewster is at a vaccine clinic in Chicago. So, Shaq, according to the data from the city, about 55 percent of Chicago residents are fully vaccinated. What are you hearing from folks who are showing up there today? Did that FDA approval encourage them at all? 
Well, I'll tell you, Allison, I spent all day at this high school, which has opened its doors to this vaccination clinic, and then sometime yesterday visiting a few different clinics. And no one said explicitly that that FDA authorization is what led them to get their vaccine. However, they said it's the mandates that are out there, the mandates to go to some restaurants, to go to a gym here in Chicago, to work in some places. Uh, those mandates have had an impact. We know that earlier this afternoon, Chicago Mayor Light Lori Lightfoot uh, actually mandated all city employees to be fully vaccinated by October 15th. That's on top of all teachers and education staff being fully uh, vaccinated. So it's the mandates that have had a large impact. However, we have heard some people say, despite their hesitations to get the vaccine, the FDA authorization has made them a little bit more comfortable to do that. That applies to this one person. I want you to hear uh, a little bit of our conversation from earlier this afternoon. I wasn't an anti-vaxxer, but I didn't exactly know. I didn't trust it too much. Um, but I, like I said, I thought other people are coming out just fine with the vaccine and um, especially with the new study uh, with Pfizer being FDA approved. That made me feel much more comfortable with choosing Pfizer. Important to note that she made her appointment to get her vaccine before that FDA authorization. But I'll tell you, I met a nurse who said she got her vaccine yesterday because she did not want to lose her job. I met a, a guitar performer who uh, said that he was losing out on gigs, losing out on opportunities because so many places were starting to mandate that full vaccination. You're getting the sense that it's more the mandates that have a bigger impact than the authorization. But some would argue that it was the authorization that led to many of the mandates, Allison. So, Shaq, I want to ask about the clinic where you are. It's at Chicago's Roosevelt High School, as you mentioned. And I understand the principal jumped at the chance to host it. How come? Yeah. He did. I mean, he put it as simply as in order to keep school open, he wanted to have as many members of his community uh, vaccinated as possible. And he said his staff is almost nearly uh, fully vaccinated. Now, that's despite the mandate that doesn't require that full vaccination until October 15th. I want you to listen to a little bit of what he told me this morning. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of anxiety attached to the vaccinations and just to COVID in general. So thinking that this is just a safe place for families and one that where they know people and feel at home and just sort of know how to navigate their way through it. So we saw people coming in, not just students. We saw teachers. We saw uh, members of the community coming in to get their vaccine. And again, what is a trusted space in this community. Allison. All right, Shaq Risser in Chicago. Thank you. Got it. It could be me. It could be any nurse. Nurses in Tampa, Florida, heartbroken. They are taking COVID patients to the morgue every day. One of them, a fellow nurse. NBC News correspondent Gabe Gutierrez takes us inside a Tampa ICU. At St. Joseph's Hospital in Tampa, the pandemic is peaking daily. This is not normal. Nurse Jamie Lillo says just yesterday she brought four patients to the morgue. I went home last night and I was mad. For Why? Her because I don't need to be doing this right now. We could have avoided this whole wave if more people in our country had gone and just gotten two shots. The BayCare Health System now has about 1,200 COVID patients, shattering its previous record of 700 last summer. This is one of the COVID ICUs. There's 26 beds here, and right now 25 of them are full. The hospital has set up overflow beds in other parts of the facility. The amount of deaths and dying that we're seeing is in my whole nursing career, I've never seen anything like it. Ambulances often have to wait here to drop off patients or they're rerouted to other hospitals that are also stretched thin. For example, if we're in critical care bypass, we're saying that we don't have beds or staff to provide care for critical care patients. So now, essentially, you're diverting ambulances about half the time now because you just don't have the beds. Exactly. Across the country, new COVID cases are up about 12% over the previous week. Hospitalizations stayed about the same, but deaths are up 23%. I think the only chance we have is, is vaccination, and that's it. Among healthcare workers, the emotional toll is measured in long shifts and longer memories. Just this week, Jamie Lillo helped care for a fellow nurse who came down with COVID and did not survive. It could be me. 
It could be any nurse. It could be anyone we know. And once you're in the bed in the ICU, you don't have any control anymore. I'm still here and I'm still trying, but um, I want to make people better. That's what I do when I can't. And it's awful. It's time for the bottom line, our daily look at what's going on in the business world and beyond. Airbnb providing temporary homes for Afghan refugees through its nonprofit, Airbnb.org. We first told you about their plans when they were announced yesterday, but now co-founder and head of Airbnb.org, Joe Gebby, is here to tell us more about what they're doing. Joe, awesome to have you here. This is very, very cool. Uh, yesterday, Airbnb CEO and co-founder Brian Chesky said, as tens of thousands of Afghan refugees resettle around the world, where they stay will be the first chapter in their new lives. For these 20,000 refugees, my hope is that the Airbnb community will provide them with not only a safe place to rest and start over, but also a warm welcome home. Uh, you're absolutely warming my heart with this news, but I have to ask, this is no easy feat. We're talking about 20,000 refugees. How are you pulling this off? Well, Allison, thank you for having me on the show. Um, this is something that's not new to us. Uh, we've been housing people who've been temporarily displaced for about 10 years now, dating back to our origins with Hurricane Sandy in New York City. Uh, so whether it's been typhoons, floods, fires, or earthquakes, uh, and, or refugee displacement, uh, we've been there to provide housing for people uh, in the short term. Uh, and in fact, over just the last couple of years, we've housed 25,000 refugees as they've found asylum in new host countries. And as Brian said in his statement, um, there's no better way to welcome someone into a new home, a new community, than by uh, staying in a home with a host on our service. So we, we couldn't be more honored than to use our platform to do this. So what's, what's the plan? How does it work if someone is an Afghan refugee and they need shelter, they need a home? How are you making that happen? Tell us about the, the process. Well, the process really starts for us with our partners. Uh, we have partner organizations that are resettlement agencies throughout the United States. Uh, they work very closely with the State Department and with the government uh, to do the vetting of refugees, uh, families, and individuals. Uh, then they come to us and they say, okay, we've got a family who needs uh, housing in uh, Northern Virginia or an individual needs housing in Sacramento, California. And, and that's where our platform goes to work. On Airbnb.org, uh, we use our platform to help match. And it's the same technology and innovation that we use to help travelers find great vacation spots. But in this case, it's to help uh, these recently resettled refugees find uh, safe and welcoming accommodations. So how long will we be offering these temp homes? Uh, and how much money is Airbnb putting behind this initiative? I know Mr. Chesky said yesterday, the company is totally funding these stays. We are totally funding these days. Um, and in most cases, hosts actually offer their homes for free or at a discount. Uh, so we'll be funding the stays. Sometimes oh, wow. hosts will, will, will also uh, volunteer as well. Um, this is, uh, think of this platform and this, this opportunity as, as a way for people to unlock their generosity uh, in a way where, uh, you know, Allison, we see these images on TV and you have to wonder what could I as one individual do to help in this kind of a situation? And actually offering your home, offering an extra room that you have down the hall is a way to make a significant impact uh, for somebody who needs it the most. So to, to anybody watching right now who has an extra room down the hall and wants to play a part in this global humanitarian crisis, uh, they can go to Airbnb.org and in about five minutes, they can list their room for a family. That is awesome. I know there are so many people out there who, who want to help and aren't sure what to do, and this is a great way to do it. You mentioned uh, you've been doing this since 2012. It started with Sandy. Could you tell us more about uh, some of the other folks you've helped over the last decade? Absolutely. Well, Airbnb.org formed formally last year, even though we've been doing these activities for about 10 years. And the mission of Airbnb.org is to unlock the power of sharing through homes, space, resources in times of need. Uh, and so we've had an opportunity to be present for hundreds of different uh, events, uh, climate change events, uh, you know, wildfires in the United States and Canada, typhoons and earthquakes in, in Asia and Japan, uh, floods and fires throughout Europe. Uh, what's really remarkable, though, is to see the Airbnb host community rally and really offer their homes uh, in unaffected areas to those who need immediate shelter because nobody was planning to leave their homes all of a sudden. Nobody had a bad bag packed. Uh, nobody scheduled you know, to book a room at a hotel somewhere. Uh, so it's just really heartwarming and uh, says a lot about our hosts uh, that they, they sign up 
and they offer their homes uh, for free at discounts. It's such an awesome partnership. It is incredible to see what businesses and, and average folks who just uh, rent their homes can do to help in a crisis. Uh, I hope that other businesses uh, will jump in and, and realize that they can make a huge difference. We're all upset watching what's going on uh, in Afghanistan. And this is a great yeah. way that we can make a difference. Thank you, Joe, so much for being on. Now, one last thing. We're actually part of uh, the Tent Foundation, tent.org. It's an organization to help empower businesses to help refugees. So any business that's watching this right now that wants to get involved can go to tent.org. Awesome. There's no such thing as too much help. Joe, thank you so very much. Thank you, Allison. Some students at Clark Atlanta University feeling a little bit lighter today. Their student debt's been wiped out. Historically, black colleges and universities using federal money from the CARES Act to help alleviate that burden. CNBC senior personal finance correspondent Sharon Epperson takes us inside their financial dream come true. We were all surprised. We were like, is this real? Is this really happening? Autumn Epps and her fellow undergrads at Clark Atlanta University were stunned when they heard their unpaid student balances had been wiped out. When I found out, I was speechless. We were all just talking about how it was such a blessing. The historically black university was one of the first in the nation to use federal pandemic relief aid to cancel student debt. We're committing $5 million, assisting nearly 2,000 students with account balances. George T. French Jr., president of the university, says the move will help boost enrollment and remove financial burdens that could prevent many students from graduating. We are reinventing the college experience so that our students can graduate nearly debt-free CAU and other schools have sparked a movement that's currently sweeping across the U.S. More than 20 historically black colleges and universities have cleared all or part of money owed for tuition and fees. And experts say that number could grow. I wouldn't be surprised if more institutions choose to utilize the funds to continue to positively impact their students because we're still in the grips of this pandemic. Autumn, a junior and Student Government Association president, says she and her friends were relieved at the unexpected financial assistance. A lot of students were contemplating how they were going to start fresh, come up with thousands of dollars. With that announcement, that definitely allowed some students to just breathe. I'm looking at all of these students who have no prior account balances and their heads are lifted and they're smiling as they begin a new year. It makes me feel tremendously gratified on the inside. And Sharon joins me now. Sharon, I just have to thank you for bringing us this story. We have not had a lot of good news lately, and I'm feeling like this block of our show uh, is just uh, great news and we could use a little bit of it. I have to say, we are big fans of Clark Atlanta here. Our, our senior producer, Brittany Ruff, is a Clark Atlanta alum. So we love them already. Uh, <laughs> and we love talking about them today. Yes. <laughs> so thanks for this. I, I have to ask, though, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. We know this pandemic is disproportionately impacting people of color. What else have you been hearing from the students there at Clark Atlanta and just at other HBCUs about what it means, how life changing it is to have their student debt canceled at a time like this? They're just absolutely relieved. And, you know, this is not just something that is yeah. occurring to them for them for one semester. This is financial security for a lifetime. Because when you look at the data and the fact that black college graduates owe about $25,000 more than white college grads in student loan debt, and over 50% of black borrowers say that their net worth is less than what they owe on student loans, you understand the reason why it's so important not to have any, at least not to have any for these semesters during the pandemic. And that is what Clark Atlanta is doing, clearing out those account balances so that imagine you look at that tuition bill and it says zero. That is so that is just so awesome, because I remember what it felt like looking at that student debt balance and just wishing it would go down a little faster, a little faster, a little faster. It takes forever. Uh, so let's talk about how they're doing this. I, I understand Clark Atlanta is helping about half of its students with their tuition and fees. Besides this federal pandemic relief aid, where else is that funding, that money coming from? And do they think they can continue wiping out debt once that federal money runs out? 
Well, keep in mind, we're talking about more than 20 historically black colleges and universities that are now doing this and using some of the federal pandemic relief aid to do it. It has spurred alumni and private donations as well. Clark Atlanta says that Mackenzie Scott, the philanthropist and former wife of Jeff Bezos from Amazon, has given $15 million to the school. Uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, a million dollars. Many more private donors are donating to Clark Atlanta and other historically black colleges and universities because they see the need to help these under-resourced schools give back to the students, be able to get the students to stay in school, to graduate, and potentially to graduate debt-free. It is a fantastic initiative. It is awesome. And Sharon, look, we've learned one thing right in the pandemic. A lot of rich folks have continued to get richer. So keep that money coming. Share the wealth, share the love, and let's wipe out some more student debt. It's fantastic. That's exactly right. Exactly right. And like we said before, it is a group effort. So companies can also, you know, chip in. The employees that you're hiring have a student repayment, debt repayment program as part of your employee perks. Yeah. A lot of companies are now thinking about that and doing that, and they're getting an incentive also from the CARES Act to do it and not have the employee have to pay taxes on the money they're getting. So that's even another way that to help. There are many ways to help, but it cannot just be the schools, the government. It has to be the community and, and uh, as well as corporate America helping too. And I think if everybody's in it, we'll lower this $1.7 trillion in student loan debt a little faster. I love it. And hey, what a great perk. If companies are saying they're having trouble hiring people, that could be a great way to get people in the door. Sharon, I will thank you again. The news hasn't been so uplifting this week. Thank you for bringing us a bright spot. A lot more at CNBC.com slash invest in new. We want to lift your spirits. We need it right now. Thanks, Sharon. QR codes have become a really popular touch-free way to order and pay for things during the pandemic, and it looks like they're not going away. But what kinds of data are they tracking, and are they infringing on your privacy? NBC News technology correspondent Jake Ward takes a look. <laughs> at El Centro in Manhattan, diners scan a code at their table with their phone to view the menu, order food and drinks, and pay their bill, all without having to flag down a server. Owner Marin Powell says these QR codes help them keep costs down during the difficult months of the pandemic. So we've been short-staffed, and we could absolutely not, never have been able to accommodate uh, our business without this. Powell's daughter, Nora Dempsey, helped introduce QR codes here. She says this system makes everything faster and easier, especially for those already using their phones to pay. And you can use Google or Apple Pay. So um, people who are already familiar with using a digital wallet, they find that the system is pretty easy to use. Manager Matthew Morfitt says when each person uses the code to create a separate tab, splitting the check is easy. And as far as having phones at the dinner table, well, Morfitt says it doesn't hurt your evening out. There's still humans here. You still get the human interaction. It's just now you can also send a margarita from your phone. But every time we scan a QR code, we are handing over information that restaurants and retailers can use to track our behavior over time. Powell says El Centro doesn't do this. It only uses information from customers to find a receipt if someone calls later to request one. But the technology could be the end of anonymously plunking down a few bucks and walking out the door. About 1.3 million U.S. businesses, including CVS, Foot Locker, and Nike, are now accepting payment via PayPal QR codes. And that number does not include businesses using other QR companies like Checkout and Square Up. Those codes can be hugely helpful to businesses. They can personalize a coupon or ask you if you'd like what you had last time. And with vivid photography in an online menu, it turns out we have a harder time choosing between one dish and another. What we're seeing is that when people can actually see those, those pictures of what the food looks like, they order both. They don't, they don't just choose one. So you get a slight uptick in sales there. Joe DePinto and Daniel Wagner co-founded BarPay, a digital QR payment system, in 2015 after they met playing professional baseball. They got tired of waiting around for drinks after games and wanted to order via their phones. Restaurants that use BarPay only need printers and QR codes on tables to get started, and customers only have to put in their name. No accounts or special apps to download. But if you want a receipt, you have to add an email address. And BarPay allows retailers to spot patterns in our behavior without giving away identifiable information. You know, if you're a major liquor provider or if you're a beer, 
we have all sorts of data now on, you know, specifically what type of person, obviously they're not getting their name or email, but you know, who's ordering what, what times are these typical items being sold? So we can do some pretty cool things with data. But some experts say QR codes collect far more data than we realize. There's an entire online industry devoted to tracking people online. And a lot of what these advertising companies want to do is they want to extend that traffic to the offline world. And by scanning a QR code, you are allowing them to do that. You know, as a consumer, you should treat a QR code like an unknown link in an email that you get. Don't click on it unless you are very sure from the overall context that you can trust whoever it is that provided you. But for businesses that have come to rely on them this year, digital payment systems like QR codes may be here to stay. A surprise reversal from the social media platform OnlyFans. The London-based company said it was banning porn from its site, but it says the porn will stay. The platform, particularly popular with sex workers. NBCNews.com reporter Callan Rosenblatt is covering this story. Uh, Callan, OnlyFans has more than 130 million users, 2 million content creators, not all sex workers, I should add. Uh, but according to reporting, the initial ban on sexually explicit content was in response to pressure from banks and payment companies. So what changed here? Well, OnlyFans has been a little tight-lipped on what exactly happened here. They did say that they secured the assurances needed to be able to support a diverse creator, uh, a, a diverse range of cre creators. However, uh, we we do know is that a bunch of creators who uh, used OnlyFans left and jumped ship. Uh, a bunch of subscribers left. There was a massive backlash to OnlyFans making this decision. And while I'm just speculating, I have to think that did not go unnoticed. No doubt. Uh, so, Callan, I have to ask you about this because it's such an interesting thing. Our colleague Joe Yurkeba at NBC News Out reporting that OnlyFans has provided a really important platform and a source of income for LGBTQ workers and that it's a form of survival from some trans people, many of them very worried when they thought the platform might be changing. Uh, could you tell us more here? Absolutely. So part of Joe's fantastic reporting included a study from 2015 that said roughly 11 percent of trans people had participated in sex work. And we know that trans people, especially black trans women, are disproportionately affected by violence. So having the ability to safely and securely engage in sex work for uh, trans people is not just a matter of livelihood, it's a matter of staying alive and safety. So this is a matter of life and death for some trans workers who rely on sex work for their income and to make sure that they don't fall susceptible to any form of violence. So this is a major deal for them as well. Great reporting from you and Joe. Callum, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Accusers and witnesses in R. Kelly's sex trafficking trial taking the stand. They're alleging the singer covered up years of abuse, including a marriage to R&B singer Aaliyah when she was just 15 years old. NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce has the latest on the trial. R. Kelly's ongoing federal sex trafficking trial focuses on six accusers who say he subjected them to psychological, sexual, and physical abuse. Prosecutors allege this was part of R. Kelly's years-long enterprise to recruit and groom young women and girls for illegal sexual activity. But his attorneys say he's innocent and that he's the one who's been victimized by women who were once his fans. Here are some of the biggest moments from the trial thus far. A former tour manager for R. Kelly, Demetrius Smith, spoke about the artist's marriage to Aaliyah, who became a child bride at just 15 years old. According to Smith's testimony, he helped Kelly bribe a government worker in Illinois to get a fake ID for Aaliyah. Smith and another witness testified the reason for their marriage was to conceal Aaliyah's pregnancy, which could have led to criminal charges for R. Kelly since she was a minor. An anonymous witness who took the stand this week was also underage. She testified she was a 17-year-old aspiring singer when she met R. Kelly, although she told him she was 18 then. Over the course of their five-year relationship, the woman told the court Kelly abused her, gave her herpes, and forced her to get an abortion. The anonymous woman told the court she eventually became one of R. Kelly's live-in girlfriends and says she was expected to abide by a strict set of rules. She testified R. Kelly required permission to do basic things, like use the bathroom, that he forced her to only wear baggy clothing and forbade her from speaking to other men. She also said Kelly hit her if she broke the rules.
Another accuser, Deronda Pace, testified to a similar pattern of abuse when she took the stand last week, just days before her due date, according to her social media. Pace wept as she described the nature of her sexual relationship with R. Kelly that started when she was just 16 years old. Like the other witness, Pace also testified Kelly subjected her to strict rules, beat her when she didn't comply, and gave her herpes. There's a bit of nuance when it comes to the crimes R. Kelly is charged with. He's not charged with individual crimes related to these accusers' accounts. Instead, prosecutors are trying to convince the jury that they were victims of a larger sex trafficking scheme. R. Kelly is facing one count of racketeering and eight sex trafficking charges related to violations of the Mann Act, which criminalizes the transportation of, quote, any woman or girl for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery or for any other immoral purpose. Throughout the trial, Kelly's legal team has attempted to portray the accusers as, quote, disgruntled groupies who are, quote, dying to be with him. On cross-examination, his defense attorney accused Geronda Pace of stalking him, a claim she denied in court. He's pleaded not guilty to all nine charges presented in this federal trial, as well as additional sex crime charges in Illinois and Minnesota.